My family, while working in the construction contracting business, has had the pleasure of working for customers of all backgrounds. We are proud to have served and meet every one of them. But a particular generation always caught our eye on the job site. If we were, if we were working in a home of a person who we knew served in World War II, we would reach a point where we would go off the clock and encourage these men to tell us their story. Many of them were kind enough to indulge our curiosity. Some preferred to keep their horror to themselves. Over the years, we have collected many interesting stories of these heroes. Many of these great men are now passed on and can no longer enlighten us of the adventure that they discovered over there. But I want to shed the light on some of the stories I have been told. I will give no names and keep the individuals anonymous out of respect since I can no longer ask for their permission to tell their stories. And I shall do my best to recall what they said for many of them are just in the head of the listener and were never written down. I also will tell the stories in a way to make you feel as I did and as my father did, sitting at the kitchen table or the sofa in their small living room. I wrote and will recite them in the first person as if they were telling the story to you. Though I cannot directly quote these men and I cannot tell you every detail, for many may slip the mind of us storytellers, I will do what I can to give you the experience that we had in talking with these members of the greatest generation. Though the way I tell these stories may make them sound as if they are fiction, I assure you that the essence of these stories are absolutely true as they came out of the mouth of the men who experienced them. May God smile upon our veterans. I was a medic, you see. I was trained for battlefield medicine. I had the latest pack in my group. I didn't have much ammunition. My pack was full of light stuff, bandages, wraps, morphine, medical tools. It didn't weigh a whole lot. Maybe only 80 pounds of that. On the morning of June 6, 1944, we were hitting the beaches of Normandy on board landing crafts. I was in the second wave. Omaha Beach was where we were heading. It was the most heavily defended beach by the Nazis on that day. As we approached in the landing craft, shells were detonating on the beach to clear the way for our boys to make our advance, but it barely made a dent. It dotted the whole beach with shell holes, but we still struggled to take the beach. As I and the second wave got close to the beach, we struck a sandbar and lodged a landing craft offshore. The driver lowered the doors and told us to go. We quickly jumped into the water and headed for the sandy beaches of France. The problem with jumping into the ocean away from shore as a soldier is the equipment that you carried. Heavy gear, helmet, ammo, guns, all weighted down the soldiers who were carrying upwards of 100 pounds of gear. When the soldiers approached the beach, they were caught in raging water 10 feet deep Many of my outfit drowned as soon as they hit the water, as they sank to the bottom, unable to swim to the surface under the weight of their packs. I was lucky. As the medic, my pack was small and lightweight. It was a struggle, but I made it. I fought my way to the shore, past the waves breaking on the sand as machine gun fire mowed down what remained of the second wave that didn't drown in the water. I made it past the barricades to see the pillboxes standing before me as the Germans rained hell down on us. Bodies lined the beach. Men from both the first and second waves that failed to gain a foothold on France's sand. I made it partially up the beach when suddenly a large explosion went up next to me. Most likely a shell of some kind and I was tossed through the air like a rag doll. Everything was black. I came to as the tide brought the water up onto my body as I was lying on the beach partially covered in sand. 
The water, mixed with the blood of my friends, lapped my face as I opened my eyes to my surroundings. I was dizzy when I first stood up, and my head hurt like hell. I knew I was concussed from my battle medical training. As I stumbled about my location, I noticed very little gunfire or noise. The battle was over, but what my eyes stared at was the carnage before me. The water was tinged dark with human blood. Body parts littered the sandy surface of the beach. Bodies were floating up on the beach, bouncing back and forth with the waves. It was a mess. It took me a couple weeks to find my outfit. During the second wave of the attack on Omaha, we numbered several hundred men. When I found them, I was one of twelve left in the group, and I was the only one who could still walk on his own. The horrors of that day took a toll on me, even today. I spent time in a psych ward after the war because of it, and I still see those images today. After D-Day, I served as the Allies pushed further into France and later into Germany. I didn't end up doing much medic work in the field of battle. I spent more time delivering babies. As the war passed through French villages, the excitement drove many pregnant women into labor, and being no doctors around, I was elected to help deliver these children. At first, I had no idea what I was doing until a surgeon set me straight. He instructed me to take my scalpel and make an incision from the back of the lady's private parts to her backside and tell her to push. Once the baby entered this world, I was to stitch up the incision and move on. And that is what I did over 160 times during the war. I delivered over 160 babies. I saw more lady parts than I ever thought I would in Europe. America had a lot of resources that our European allies did not. They needed us to supply them, and we had a long way to travel. You see, they had to go across the Atlantic in ships, but the German U-boats were just under the surface, preying on us as we were herds of cattle, and they were the wolves. I was a merchant marine. Something you don't hear much of. We were not a military branch, nor were we really soldiers. We were mariners who operated merchant vessels in our world's oceans. But in times of war, we all became soldiers. During the war, I operated as a seaman in many convoys. The U.S. government took control of the private merchant vessels and coordinated the supply chain across the oceans. They felt that it was safer for us to travel in large groups across the Atlantic as a convoy. We were ordered to travel as fast as possible and stopped for no reason. The military armed these merchant ships and armed us as well. The weapons, however, were really no use to German submarines. When you think fighting men of World War II, you usually don't think of the merchant marines, but we had the largest rate of casualties among the different fighting groups in the U.S. military. We were also some of the first in the war to receive casualties. It was a dangerous job. I had two ships sunk under me. I was lucky enough to get picked up by other ships traveling in the convoy. They would stop for nothing. That was the rule. If you couldn't get to the ship as it went by, you were left behind for the good of the war cause. You drowned in the vast waters of the Atlantic. I lost many friends that way. The most dangerous ship to be on was a tanker hauling fuel. Well, many ships carried, carried ammo and guns and tanks and trucks and jeeps and food. The tankers only carried oil and gas. This made them extremely explosive. If a U-boat's torpedo hit a regular cargo ship, it would sink. If a tanker is hit by that same torpedo, it goes off like a bomb, killing everyone on board instantly. I was able to be on tankers on our many crossings but never were they hit while I was on board. But one time a tanker was hit in my convoy and I was on the next ship over. When the U-boat was detected, we went on the defensive. I was on the deck of my ship when the torpedo buried itself in the side of the tanker. 
In an instant, the tanker exploded with a giant fireball, and the shock wave from the explosion shook my ship and blowed me across the deck and off the other side. Within an instant, I was in the cold waters of the North Atlantic. As my ship continued east at full speed away from me, I tread water with my life vest inflated around my neck. Next to me was the burning heap of the tanker leaking oil onto the surface of the water around me. As the remaining convoy of ships sped past the wreck, I waved and yelled at the top of my lungs, hoping to get the attention of someone on board. In a few minutes, my body was coated in oil as it snaked around me. The fire began to spread across the surface as the oil began to catch on fire, and it was heading towards me. If I didn't drown, I would have burned. Suddenly, a small ship bringing up the rear of the convoy began to approach, and I yelled out a few words to get their attention. I began to swim, and swim hard towards the ship. Luckily, someone heard my cries as the fire approached closer to my position. When I got to the side of the hull of the ship, a rope ladder lowered down towards me, and I grabbed hold of it and began to climb. For years, us merchant marines were not really recognized for our efforts during the war. It is said we may not have won the war for the Allies, but us merchant marines contributed so much to the war effort that the war would not have been won without us. We fought and died to bring supplies to our soldiers on the front lines. Now, we are finally getting recognized. Look at this. I received this just a few years ago. It is a special citation for us merchant marines thanking us for our efforts. In the 1980s, a group of men sat in a restaurant enjoying a nice meal, a cold beer in the company of one another. With great company comes great conversation and sometimes meaningful conversation. It was the time of the Cold War in which the world was threatened by a new menace of the 20th century, the nuclear bomb. These men were from all walks of life, contractors, businessmen, store owners. Though many were older, some were young, but all were affected by the threat of the bomb. The conversation switched to that subject. Was it really necessary? Did the world really need to go that far? Was it worth it? The opinion of the majority was clear. These men would have been better off if it never existed in the first place. A member of this group was quiet as the rest debated the subject. After dinner, one of the younger men of the group approached this quiet man who was much older than his companion that's asking the questions here and asked him the younger man asked him his opinion on the subject. The quiet man responded with the following story. I served in the Pacific in World War II. I was one of the American soldiers on the Bataan Peninsula on the Philippine island of Luzon. We were a combined force of U.S. and Filipino soldiers trying to hold our weak position against the advancing Japanese who were pushing us into the sea. We had very little naval and air support. We were cut off, pinned on a peninsula between the Japanese army and the ocean. We suffered starvation and disease. On April 9, 1942, we surrendered to the Japanese. We were marched to POW camps, a five-day journey known today as the Bataan Death March. The Japanese beat us, starved us, refused us water. Many were forced to drink the parasite-infested waters of the jungle, twisting our guts until we died. We were denied shelter and basic first aid supplies. Many men were randomly stabbed with knives by our guards. Some were beheaded. The weak were bayoneted. It was estimated that 650 Americans and 16,500 Filipinos died on that march from that brutality. Once we reached the POW camps, 
Disease and starvation killed thousands more. Yet, I survived. I was later transferred to Burma, where I was used as slave labor for the Japanese Imperial War cause. The jungle was brutal. Disease was a constant problem, and we were all malnourished and mistreated. The Japanese could barely feed their own army, let alone the prisoners they had taken. We wore barely any clothes, just a loincloth. We were hungry, and we were starving to death. As time crept on, I lost track of it. I eventually was taken to mainland Japan, as the Japanese military was being reined in by the advances of the American forces. I ended up at a coal mine just east of Nagasaki, Japan. What little clothing I had was tattered. I had not worn shoes in years. The calluses on my feet were two inches thick. I probably weighed just a little over 100 pounds. I was nothing but skin and bones, for I was a tall individual. But I pressed on in hopes that the war would end and I would be able to return and see my family again. They wanted you to be productive at the coal mine, despite our weaknesses from lack of nourishment. The camp had an unofficial role. If a prisoner wanted to give up and die, you simply had to go over and lay by the fence. That was it. That showed you could no longer be productive. And a Japanese guard would come along and run you through with a bayonet and give you your wish. I watched many of my fellow prisoners give up. They all met their fate with a bayonet. I wanted to give up, but I refused. I pressed on with all my might, but my body was giving out. Over several days, my eyesight was dimming and it was becoming harder to see. I was so weak that my eyes were shutting down. I remember one morning, a large, dark, strange-looking cloud rising up in the west. It was a spectacle I have never seen before. It looked much like a mushroom. We had no idea at the time what it was. One day, with my dimming eyesight getting worse, I decided that I had enough. I wanted the good Lord to take me away from my suffering. I survived nearly three and a half years in captivity at the brutal hands of the Japanese, and I finally couldn't take any more. With what little eyesight I had left, I dragged my weak shell of a body over to the fence, and I laid down. And I laid there, waiting to meet the point of a soldier's bayonet. Shortly after, my vision failed me completely, and I continued to lay there, now in darkness, for what seemed like days, waiting on the merciful steel of the bayonet. But it never came. Death refused to claim me. Several days later, a familiar voice could be heard, but I felt it would have been impossible. A strong male voice speaking English. Several GIs gathered me up from my place by that fence and took me to hospital. I needed food, but could not eat a lot for fear it would burst my small stomach. I ate very little at a time. I was a walking skeleton. Eventually my vision came back and many of my motor skills too. I rebuilt muscle and I put on weight. What took me the longest was the ability to wear shoes. I couldn't wear shoes for a year and a half for my feet were too callous to wear them. You ask me my opinion on the bomb. The, the nuclear bomb has created such fear in the world today. I have to say that I am damned grateful for it. The bomb ended the war quickly, and it is what saved my life 
and just in the nick of time too. I worked on farms all my childhood and so was allowed to avoid going to war. But the times were different than compared to today. Farmers were important to the war effort, so we were allowed to stay stateside. But to society, I was a draft dodger, and men, boys, and girls slurred me. I felt ashamed for not doing my required duty. On August 1st, 1944, while running a load of stock to sell at auction in Greencastle, I went to the draft board. In two weeks, I was on my way to the army in Harrisburg at Indiantown Gap. After boot camp in Spartanburg, South Carolina, furlough back home, which was when I met my wife at Jack McLaughlin's restaurant, and time spent at Fort Meade, I found myself on a ship bound for Europe in the winter of 44 or 45. The ocean turned rough and everyone was sick. I got sick but never threw up. Some of the boys couldn't eat at all. If they did, it came right back up. I was on guard duty part of the time in front of the toilet. Boys were running up the step and would let it fly before they got to the toilet. They were not feeding me enough to throw up. I only got two meals a day. Once we landed in Naples, one soldier who was seasick the entire time said to me that if the Germans don't kill him, he will not go back across that ocean. I told him I don't care what happens, I'm going back across if I have to take a damn rowboat. In Italy, they sent us through some training, more than what we got back in the States. I remember one of the night training courses. There were maybe a thousand men in the dark going through the fields. They hollered to hit the dirt. I fell down quick and landed on a high place. They fired machine guns over top of tracer, tracer bullets. It didn't seem much over a couple of inches above my head. It didn't take me long to crawl to the ditch to get a little lower. At the same time, flares and dynamite were being shot off in holes around us. There was lots of noise. They were training us for combat, you see. They gave us a gun but didn't give us any ammunition. Not sure what use the gun was without something to shoot with it. On May 8, 1945, they announced over the camp loudspeaker that the Germans surrendered. Everybody ran out of the tents and started cheering. That May, they loaded about 500 of us in trucks and took us northward. We passed through Pisa, up over mountains to Florence, and then onward to Bologna and Milan. It was a ride of our lives. Many of the towns we passed were all blown to hell and fields were full of bomb craters. Bricks were scattered all over the place. I saw a lot of women and kids living with nothing over their heads, only a fire and an iron pot. We traveled to Lake Lagarda, which was beautiful. Went out in the lake on a rowboat, got out to take a swim and the wind blew my boat away. I almost drowned trying to catch it. It was almost like a vacation, but I was homesick. I was half crazy. To take a vacation like that today would cost thousands of dollars. I was put in the signal corps to build telephone lines. That is where I learned to climb poles and become a linesman, something I continued to do when I finally made it back home here. I started to get stripes and they promoted me. I guess I was good as any, but I was stupid and still raised hell, drank and carried on with the rest of the boys. I eventually became staff sergeant and they gave me my own work crew to service telephone lines. We all wanted to go home and we got lazy. Many of my men were troublemakers and some of them got in a fight with an Italian store owner and stole some items from him. I should have called the MPs, but I did not, so I got in trouble with them. They charged us with armed robbery, which I asked how it could be armed robbery when we didn't have any freaking bullets. I was demoted to private and caged like a monkey for two weeks in a stockade. One of my cellmates kept climbing the fence and running away. The MPs would catch him and throw him back in the stockade. Several times this soldier did this until one day a colonel or some high rank officer or official or something witnessed one of his escape attempts. 
The colonel then walked over to the stockade and asked the MPs if this man was causing trouble. They told of his many escape attempts. The colonel then drew a line in the dirt with his foot just outside the fence and told the MPs, Do you see this line, soldier? If that son of a bitch crosses that line, shoot him. The MPs both shouted, Yes, sir! And as the colonel walked away, the MPs were egging on the prisoner to run. Come on, run, you son of a bitch, they said. <laughs> he never ran. In about December 1945, they shipped me about 500 miles northeast of Pisa to Trento, northwest of Venice. I was assigned to guard duty in the medical corps as special police. One chilly Italian night, I was standing guard to a military barracks full of sleeping GIs. I went to the garage attached to the barracks and found a kerosene heater so I could warm myself. I didn't know how to work it, so I fiddled with it a bit and spilled kerosene all over the floor. When I finally got it lit, the barracks caught on fire too. I tried to put it out, but it just kept spreading. So I ran through the barracks yelling to wake up all the soldiers and get them out for safety purposes. We all stood out in the cold and watched the barracks go up in the flames. The local newspaper wanted to put me in an article about the brave GI that saved all those men from a fiery death. <laughs> I refused, of course. I served as a guard until April 1946 when he returned me to Pisa and put me on a ship called the SS New Bern Victory. This is the second time they tried to ship me from Italy. The first time was August of 1945 when they were sending me to the Pacific uh, to fight the Japanese, but before I could board the boat, uh, Japan surrendered. But in April 1946, I was finally going home. The ship took me to New York where I went to New Jersey to be mustered out at an army camp. I then caught a bus to Mercersburg. I arrived back home after 20 months in the army, and I arrived at midnight. After getting off the bus, I shouldered my duffel bag and walked home to Klalik. I got home about two in the morning. Nobody expected me because I didn't write. I was depressed and felt like a failure. I walked the fields of the farm the rest of the night. That last GI was my grandfather. I remember him well as we sat on the carport overlooking his apple trees and him telling me many of these stories. Despite feeling like a failure in the military, Pap was proud he served in his later life, enough to have an army sticker on his back window of his Ford Ranger. Pap was hard to talk to. He only had 10% of his hearing and you had to yell at him for him to understand you. Though he wrote some of his story down later in life, many of the stories I shared tonight were ones that he was too embarrassed to write down. So he told them to my dad and I. Many of the greatest generation are gone now, and many of their stories are lost to time. We live in a busy world, one that is unkind and unmerciful, one where time is the most precious resource you have. Take time to talk to the old folks, the loved ones who are in their waning years. Record it, write it, save it for your grandchildren so their stories, no matter how mundane they may think they are, can become a teaching aid for the generations to come. Thank you for tuning in tonight. Thank you for your support. And if you would like to see more, please subscribe to the channel and give this video a like. May God bless our veterans.